Welcome back to the Yellow Turbans Abridged. Last time we were auto-resolving our way through Gonglang Shu and the Duchy of Zhong. We also got invaded by the Duchy of Song temporarily, but we wiped out a load of their troops and then peaced out of that war, so we won't worry about them. And finally, we've made it to the end game. We've now got three targets to take down to win the campaign. Before we can do that though, we just need to finish off the bits and pieces of Gonlan Shu's faction that will secure our border a bit more before we go marching off somewhere. There's Gonlan Shu trying to get peace with us, we reject that because it feels like we're about to take her downtown. However, she had a secret plan, there was an army up near Luoyang hiding around that comes to attack the trade port. Fortunately, the trade port, as we've seen before, is quite easy to defend and I even had some troops here. The enemy generously poured most of their army against one entrance so it was easy to stop them. They did have some archers who threatened to set fire to the towers but I sent some men out to take the archers out. And then, well, we just sit back and kill the enemy's infantry with our archers and our towers, of course. Here we are a little bit later, their commander comes to stand just behind the front line, give them a few arrows and that's the end of them. One tower did go down there as you can see but we've now taken out the enemy archers and I'm going to use my cav back there to draw the enemy's cav onto a line of spears at another entrance. Long story short, they all die. Not much to it, and that's going to be the end of that. The enemy army is functionally mauled, both commanders are dead, most of the units are gone as well, and Gong Lang Chu's sneaky plan to counterattack has utterly failed. So now we'll continue just wrecking her faction in general. First, we need to retake the place that she took from us previously, the bit that links our main territory to our southern colonies. So we do that with Xu He. Then we're going to attack Shang Yang's toolmaker. We took the city of Shang Yang last time, just need to finish off this little bit of Gonlan Shu territory in this area. Easy enough auto resolve, even though the balance bar was kind of close, doesn't matter about the losses in this case. With this done, we don't really have that much exposure to Gonglan Shu anymore. I'm going to zoom out here and we'll see the strategy map in general. It's actually better than it's ever been, I'd say. Look at this, this huge border that we're not at war along. We've just got this little war in the south with the tiny remnant of Gonglan Shu. Actually, I got peace with her at this point, and in the peace deal, I took part of that remnant. I took the Jiangyang copper mine that I've been wanting to take for a long time. That makes our territory look even better. And Gonglan Chu is just in huge trouble now in general. So, we are at peace along the entire border right now. We've done it. And now it's time for us to start preparing to continue the game. This means we need to attack the three kingdoms. Two of them are kind of boring generic kingdoms in the top right of the map. So I'm going to go for the more interesting but more difficult route of attacking the big main one, the Duchy of Wu, first. So we're setting up for that in the south. In the meantime, I did have a little side project, because Luoyang is under our control except for the city itself, so I decided to declare war on Zhao Yumin to take the city, because I think she only has this one region as well. I have to break a peace treaty to do this, and everyone's going to hate me for a while as a result. But you know how it is, they already hate me. <laughs> Yellow turbans have penalties with everyone all the time, so I thought, what difference will this make? We'll just get the war going. I also did this bit of experimental diplomacy. I supported the independence of one of the Duchy of Wu's vassals, Huang Shi. What I thought this would do was put me at war with the Duchy of Wu right now. I didn't mind being at war with them already. I thought Huang Shi would break away and we'd both be at war. But I guess how this works is it's just if Huang Shi wants to break away at some point, I get drawn into the war. But the thing is, we don't have time to wait for them to decide to be independent. So really not much will come of that, but I did try and do something sneaky at least. Up with Zhao Yumin, I laid siege to her city obviously and in the next turn I'm ready to attack. She does have an army outside, but I used a night attack with Zhang Kai to ignore it and just swept the city away. As for the army, it's still there and might re-besiege us, but I've got my backup army and Zhao Yumin's force isn't very far away from the town, so we actually get reinforcements here and we can double team that force to bring it down. That's going to be pretty much the end of Zhao Yumin's faction. Now, as I said, I can't be bothered to wait for Huang Shi to make a move, so I'm just going to declare war on the Kingdom of Wu. I've been calling them the Duchy of Wu, haven't I? They are a kingdom now. Sun Tzu, basically. And we're going to get this war going. We're not in position because some of our armies are up in that Zhao Yumin place, but we're just doing it. We're going to try and make this campaign nice and efficient by trying to use our time. Now, we are ready in the south to attack, and actually, 
the Kingdom of Wu has been encroaching on Gonlan Shu's lands. I think Gonlan Shu might be gone at this point, actually. So the lands that she used to have are now enemy territory, so we are going to take them in the end by the looks of things. We're starting off with the Fooling Rice Paddy. We move in and there's actually an army nearby. It's a big army, but again, in this case, we are able to use Night Attack in this instance. So we'll just auto-resolve the garrison of the paddy and move on in there. It does mean the army will be able to counterattack right away, and this time we've no backup force to try and keep them at bay. So we'll just have to see what they do with that. Just to the south, we're going to retake the Zenke Tea House using Shuha and our more experienced stack of trash. No problems there. And we've got a third trash stack in the south, although this one's less trashy. You can see in this army, I've bothered to recruit some of our actual units. Decided to go for a wild venture and recruit things that weren't the stuff you have at the start of the game, just to see how they perform in battle and get a bit of variety. The more expensive, obviously, and it's anti-meta. Spamming cheap units is usually better in Total War than using veteran and expensive ones, but we'll see. Right away, we take some territory from Xihui, but there's more territory to take along the southern coast of China. So there we go, we've got three armies battling Xihui and Sun Tzu. As for our main forces and our main area of territory in the north, it only slightly borders the Kingdom of Wu. So we're going to move through Shangyang Commandery and try to sneak down towards Jiangling and get a war started on this front as well. However, first we have to tolerate the Kingdom of Wu's first turn against us. And as I thought, the army near that rice paddy just immediately attacks it. The enemy army is pretty strong actually, and we have just taken damage from doing an auto resolve, so there's some potential for the enemy to inflict damage. However, as it turns out, this rice paddy isn't like generic farmlands, it counts as a settlement, so the enemy can only attack along a really narrow front, and we have towers supporting us, so it's actually going to be quite a lot easier than expected. The enemy do have some crossbows, so they have the opportunity to stand outside of the range of the towers and kill some of my men. They start doing that, but they are also advancing. You can tell I was trying to kill those peasant spears by throwing them out in front, but annoyingly, the enemy crossbows are shooting over the top at the more valuable troops behind, mean of them. They're also advancing at repeating crossbowmen, but their range is really short. They have to run to be right in front of you before they fire, and we're killing them before they arrive. At the other front, we get a bit of a harsh charge from the enemy. They sneak some lancers through their infantry as they charge and smash our yellow turban warriors and we lose loads of them. That unit will now be swamped by all the enemy swords and will essentially be sacrificed out there. It's going to be hard for it to survive. Just needs to stop the enemy from moving while we gradually whittle them down using the towers and our nearby archers. I've got two half-dead units of cav who were just wandering about on the enemy side of this river, being a distraction. I think they went to try and fight some archers and actually lost in melee, but they did their job as a distraction. And now the battle just comes down to a grind. We can't move, the enemy can't really move, just have to wait for the enemy to die and hope our archers and towers do the business quickly. In the meantime, I was expecting, inspecting, some of the fighting going on the front lines, and just confirming what I'd said earlier in this series, that the animation seemed to have improved, I think what happened is, with the patch that updated the game in preparation for the Blood and Gore effects DLC, they did something to the animation. Some new animations have definitely been added in, even if you don't have the DLC. A load more, especially on the campaign map, have become apparent. And just the general aggression of troops has increased. The guys at the front are always doing something, which was always the big problem with the mass combat animation. It's still not perfect, you'll still see guys just standing around kind of watching while their friends die in front of them. But it's better than it was, it's progress, and if you kind of blur your eyes and don't look at any particular spot for too long, it does look a bit like a mass melee might in your imagination, so that's something. Just saying, I quite like it nowadays, despite criticising the animations of the game specifically in this very series. Anyway, as for the battle, the enemy eventually left, didn't really do anything, they gave up, and we won. We did take some losses in the fight in those grinds, especially to the enemy crossbows, and that unit that got trashed by the enemy's cav was dead by the end of things. Actually, there might have been a unit that got killed by the crossbows. We lost one unit, basically. We'll be able to get it back soon enough, though. We do see an army from Wu coming up the river near Jiang Ling. We have a couple of options here. I could try and stop them, because they might go past me and attack my territory. Or I can do what I'm doing here. I'm going to have Jiang Kai rush down as he comes to join the battlefront and have him act 
as our defences in case the enemy bypasses and at the same time use my vanguard force to continue the offensive trying to take Jianling since it's undefended right now. As for the survivors of the battle at the rice paddy, there they go, just had to step outside and auto resolve them as usual. So now the area is a bit secure, but not very secure. As you can see to the northeast, there's another enemy army, and this army is from Huangshe. Since they haven't declared independence, they are still fighting with the Kingdom of Wu, so we still have to fight them until such a time as they choose to just be their own state. And here they come, they're bringing a high level army towards us, and I set up an ambush to try and stop them. For Shu He, we've got two targets to potentially attack. I think I go for the trade port here first, but we'll look into that later on. And in the south, just need to keep going against Shi Hui. No sign of any enemy armies, even though we have seen one walking about recently. So they have at least one stack somewhere, but it's not here, not on the front line. Not sure where it could otherwise be, but fine, we'll just keep going. Now that army in the river actually lands and does attack the force that I was trying to get past them with. In this case, I use retreat and they don't pursue. Perhaps they were out of movement points, so we don't have to fight them. Although another army appeared, and then another army appears down near Fu Ling. So that area is starting to look quite dangerous. Our not very good army has to face two enemy armies. At least we're ambushing this first one. The ambush succeeded, but even then, the situation is still bad simply because the enemy units are quite high level. So while both sides are deploying mostly just trash, high-level trash units are actually quite powerful. Experience matters rather a lot in this game, as I've been learning. For example, in this battle, we'll see the enemy perform quite well in comparison to other cases where we've just ambushed and annihilated enemy armies. It starts pretty much the same as usual, of course. Both sides just plow into each other and fighting breaks out. But what we're not seeing is whole units disappearing, even in cases where I've done things like attacking with cavalry against sword units that sometimes just disappear underneath cavalry. It's not happening, and several enemy units are unengaged, they're free to attack us, like their archers. And interestingly, they're using their fire arrows against my guys who are in a forest, and we're starting to see some kind of fire attack coming through. Across the column, it's just not happening. Usually by this point in the battle we've won one part of the column and my men are starting to move to go and take out other ones. But it's much more of a grind. If you look at my units you can see lots of them have already lost lots of their strength. It seems in some cases like we are the ones who are getting annihilated. These melees just aren't happening because high level militia squads are better even than things that technically counter them like our yellow turban warriors. And with this fire attack our archers are in trouble. I'm sure most of the losses were done by the arrows themselves, of course by the arrows themselves, but in theory that fire attack is taking my guys out, and as I played I didn't even think about it or notice it. Here was an example of things going badly, I spotted some enemy peasant band just annihilating my men, look at the bodies on the floor, this is the worst unit in the enemy army and it's just killing my men in melee. Being high level really does make a difference, we'll see more examples of that coming soon in this campaign actually. So yes, the grind carries on, and we do win eventually. It is a night attack and an ambush, so the enemy army is possible to rout, but we're losing loads of men, and in all the individual fights, we're losing, and then we just technically win on morale just before they beat us. That's really how it's going. This unit of archers is being really saved by this one tree. I was trying to kill them with my own archers, but it looks like this tree was deflecting all the shots, and of course I didn't notice. You can see across the column, we're getting there now. The enemy units have mostly scattered, but we don't have much left either by the looks of things. We finally get a hold on the battle at last when my cav are freed up from fighting in melees across the place to go and take out all those enemy archers, stop them from harassing us after they got tons of kills against us. And at this stage, the balance bar will finally move into our favor and we can start clearing things up. The enemy now have the army losses, morale penalty, so it's going to be easier to rout them. Here's another melee, but look at the ground underneath the melee. Look how many men we lost in these static fights. Even with our two-handed swords fighting the enemy's spears. It did say in a tooltip I spotted recently that swordsmen are the hard counter to spearmen. That was the case in all the Total War games as well. I thought that wasn't the case in this game. It doesn't seem like there's any explicit bonus for fighting spears using swordsmen. I thought swords were more about blocking missiles in this game's meta. But maybe there's some advantage in theory to having swords against spears. Anyway, 
By the end of things, we got a close victory, at least it wasn't a Pyrrhic victory. We did lose half of our army, but we can mitigate that quite a lot because we get a big recruitment bonus at the end. We also executed an enemy officer, as you saw. The question in the end is just going to be, did we lose too many men to deal with the fact that there's also a Wu army now in the same territory? As it happens though, the Wu army is not that big, it's only a two officer force. So we can just counterattack right now, they're also in March stance, so they're extra weak. They retreat from us as we attack and that's a really good sign, they don't want to fight us so that balance bar has got to be good. In fact, you can see it right there, it's in our favour. That means we can win for free. I expected to go in and have to fight this one, but we can just take the auto resolve. And there's a perfect example. That was an animation that definitely wasn't in the game earlier in this campaign. And I think it's an animation from the Blood Gore thing DLC, but with the Blood and Gore taken away. So he just weirdly like chopped the enemy's guy in half using a stick, but it didn't happen. So perhaps I'm not just crazily ranting about the animations being improved over time with the Jiangling situation. Gonna continue with the plan, we'll ignore the two armies in the area, and perhaps very dangerously just take the town. The danger being that those two armies can turn around and trap us inside, and that could be quite difficult for us to deal with. But we're just gonna take that risk, just gonna move on in and see what the enemy do, basically. With this territory, we have a bit of access to Changsha in the south, and that's the general direction we want to go in. Ling Ling, our target commandery, is directly south of where we are, basically. So our main force is going in the right direction. All that stuff in the southwest is kind of a distraction. We don't need those territories, but might as well take them. Zhang Kai is on the way to support near Zhang Ling. I'm putting him in a hidden position as he advances, which is kind of dangerous because it means he's less of a distraction. The enemy are now more likely to attack the town rather than him. And indeed, one of their armies does, but the other army walks off somewhere else. So that's not so bad. The town can hold against one stack easily. We've got towers and a stack inside. Here's some good news as well. Huang Xia finally does break away from the Kingdom of Wu. So now Huang Xia is at war with Sun Tzu, but I don't think this has any effect vis-a-vis -vis our deal with them to support their independence. It mentions it here. But we're not like automatically at peace with them because of the deal or something. That said, I can get peace with them. And because we're so powerful, I can actually negotiate some territory in the peace. I threw in some weapons and some models to make Huang Xia happy. And with the peace deal, I ended up getting the other side of Jiang Ling. So we now have the whole commandery actually. That's very nice and neat. There was one thing I missed out in this peace deal though. And that was me forgetting I'd actually put together a new army over in the Shu region. And that army was about to capture the Badong iron mine, which we used to have a long time ago. So we could have taken that and then we'd have even more territory and even more leverage in the deal. That was a bad oversight. At least though, the army can now immediately move on to go down the river towards Jianling and help. With Huang Xia out of the war, our southwestern war is a bit easier as well because Fu Ling isn't going to be attacked anymore. We can therefore just move on freely, so I can set up to go and attack the Zhangke town once we're ready. And just to the south, we can finish off the Zhangke trade port with Xu He. There's actually quite a lot of stuff in the garrison there, but our trash stack is high level, so we can just pile on through and take the place with an auto resolve. In the south, we can also continue our advance against Xi Hui, and for some reason there's just been no resistance so far. I'm gonna lay siege to this city and see what happens. As I said, they've got an army somewhere, just yet to see it. Now as for the siege down at Jianling, Zhang Kai is going to start moving to reinforce, but the road takes a very long route, so we can't arrive right now. But as I mentioned, we're not in any real danger because if they attack the town, they'll probably get taken out. And actually, by the next turn, the enemy didn't really do anything. So now we're going to clear up some mess. First, we take that city that we just besieged. Again, still no sign of Shi Hui's army. And the army that besieged Jian Ling actually broke the siege in their turn, but then just stood there. So we move out and with Zhang Kai now nearby to reinforce, we can just auto resolve that army to death and that's an easy win for us. So that was easier than expected. This guy will be captured, Lun Yuan, 
He's such a happy chappy, look at that cheeky grin. And the other guy we captured was trying to smile but was less successful. So we execute the faker and the happy guy gets to live, although their army did just disappear so I don't really know what happened with that. The second army we saw recently is still nearby, so that will be our next target in the area. We can also now go and make that attack at the Zanka town that I mentioned, and with that Zanka commandery is secured. There are still plenty of targets here, there's loads of territory that we just never had line of sight on, but the Kingdom of Wu has loads of stuff down here in the bottom left of the map. So far it's also undefended, which is nice, so we'll keep going, for example right here with Xu He. Gonna move south to try and find some new targets, but on the way, we finally do see some resistance. There is a Wu army in March stance coming towards us. So a battle is now on the horizon. This was an annoying discovery because I discovered at the end of my movement points. I can't react to this. I'm just standing there now awkwardly in front of them and they're probably gonna walk right into me because we're in a choke point. Indeed, in the Wu turn, the army near Zhengling runs away, but this army comes and attacks. I'm going to retreat and get out the way because I don't want to fight these guys right now. Since we have another army nearby, we can easily go for a two-on-one if we can negotiate the movement. Now we see Sun Tzu appear up near Jianling, so it looks like a showdown is building. As for this two-on-one deal, it didn't quite work because the enemy pulls the classic trick, the oft complained about march retreat and the retreat through zone of control complaint as well. So we sort of had them trapped, but they just phased through our men and now they're in march stance and beyond us that will never catch up one of those really annoying situations. But ignore that, I'm more interested in this potential battle. Sun Tzu is standing there in march stance and I have the potential to go after him with both of my armies. The first army gets into position. The second army, it says I can't reach, but I can sort of reach by using the water. By going into boats and then getting off boats nearby, I'm just next to Sun Tzu. But it doesn't look like I'm quite in reinforcement range. I think I needed to go slightly further down the river to be able to engage Sun Tzu this turn with both armies. So I messed that up, I think. However, we can drop the old ambush right in front of our field army tactic and see what that does. As for our reinforcements who are on the way, I'm going to put them on the opposite bank of the river and hide them because I don't want Sun Tzu going in that direction. I want him to go towards the ambush. Here comes the Wu turn. And it doesn't quite go to plan. We see some more Wu troops in the east that we'll need to keep in mind. And what appears to happen is the secondary army, so not Sun Tzu, comes over and attacks the force that was ambushing. The ambush must have been uncovered. And we've ended up with a battle between the two generic armies where the two more important armies are reinforcements. So we are going to have a faction leader showdown between Zhang Kai and Sun Tzu in this hashtag massive battle in the next part.